Welcome to Heads Up Anesthetics. So in this talk, we're going to go through applying for anesthetics, uh, the steps involved in the process, and what you can do to really maximize your chances of getting an offer for anesthetics. So first of all, my name's Lasith Ranasinghe. I'm the founder of Make a Medic, and um, I am an offer holder for ACCS Anesthetics Training in London, which I hope to start in August 2023. Um, so if you do have any questions after watching this video, then please feel free to email me. Uh, on chair at makeamedic.org and please do also check out our website there's plenty of other resources on there that you may find useful so i imagine if you're watching this video you're already considering a career in anesthetics but just as a, a brief overview of the factors that people generally consider to be pros and cons first of all from a pros perspective um, managing acutely unwell patients can be quite exciting and that's something anesthetists get to do quite often uh, you develop, obviously, a lot of practical skills by doing various procedures in so many different contexts. And you also tend to be quite well integrated with various different aspects of hospital medicine as well. So you'll see anesthetists in theatres, in resus, in obs and gynae, in various different settings. And they tend to be very important um, in the context of hospital medicine. And there's also lots of scope, really. There's loads of different things you can do. There's obviously plenty of scope for research. You can do pre-hospital emergency medicine like HEMS. Um, and uh, I've, I've even known um, consultants who work for things like the British Boxing Federation and, and do really cool um, uh, jobs on the side as well. Uh, so really the potential is endless. And I'd say another really good thing about the training for anaesthetics is that, is that it's famously well supported. So you get a lot of one-to-one -one teaching with consultants and they really do help you develop your skills. As for the cons, obviously it's very on-call heavy, so during your anaesthetics training you will be doing quite a lot of uh, evenings and weekends and nights. Uh, the exams are known for being very tough and very technical. And for some of you, if you are looking for a shorter training program, then anaesthetics is, uh, is a relatively long one. So it does take probably about seven to nine years in total uh, to complete um, your anaesthetics training. So here's a brief overview of the training program. Okay, so I've tried to demonstrate it as blocks where uh, one block is one year. So you've probably got to the stage where you've done F1, F2, or you're in the middle of it, or you're uh, in the middle of an F3 or F4, or whatever. After this, you can either become an anaesthetist through core anaesthetics or through ACCS anaesthetics. So the difference is that core anaesthetics only does anaesthetics and ITU, and it lasts three years. Whereas with ACCS anaesthetics, the core STEM part of ACCS is that you do six months of ED and six months of acute medicine in the first year. You then do six months of anesthetics and six months of ITU in the second year. And this part, the first two years, is common amongst ACCS anesthetics, ACCS ED, and ACCS IM. The bit that changes is that after those two years, ACCS anesthetics trainees will do two further years of anesthetics. And that's actually a recent curriculum change which was brought into effect uh, in 2021. Uh, it used to be just three years, but now you actually have an extra year of being an anaesthetics reg um, to you know, pass the exams, develop your skills before proceeding on to the next stage of training. Speaking of which, after you've done that first stage, so either ACCS or core, you can either do anaesthetics alone, you can dual train in ICU and anaesthetics, and some people may even choose to do anaesthetics, sorry, ICU on its own. Um, so those tend to be the main routes that people take after doing that initial stage one training in anaesthetics. So this is an overview of the application process as it stands in 2022-2023. So the application cycle I've just gone through is for 2023 uh, start. So how it worked for us was that in no November time we uh, could apply on Oriel, so filling in a few boxes about your details and previous employment, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then, to be honest, not a lot uh, happened after that until the MSRA in January. And then eventually we'll have interviews in February and March. And we just got our offers uh, just now in April. The competition ratio um, for anaesthetics, uh, the one that's quoted on the, on the website, is that it's 4.19 uh, candidates per offer. So if I should go through each of these in turn... So first of all, applying on Oriel is, is actually quite straightforward for anaesthetics trainees. There's no white space, there's no sort of declaration of prizes or publications or anything like that. Uh, it's just a bunch of details about yourself. So there isn't really much um, that needs to be filled in. I managed to do it in about half an hour or so. It didn't take an awful lot of time. Um, and, and that was it, really. There isn't that much you need to declare about yourself. 
Uh, then the MSRA, uh, you sit that in January. There's usually about a two-week window in which you sit that exam uh, in a Pearson View Center. Um, I'll go on to talk about that in a moment. But the score is used for uh, shortlisting in the first instance. So if you've got a score that's below the cutoff, you won't be considered at all for, for interviews. And if it's above the cutoff, you will get an interview. And the MSRA score will contribute 15% of your total. The interview then happens between February and March and will contribute... 85% uh, of your total score. So both of those things together will determine whether you get an offer. So the MSRA is the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment, which was initially brought in to help select candidates for GP training. So it is quite primary care based, and I'll give you a few example questions uh, from their website in a second, but it seems to over time have swallowed up various different specialties. Um, so in 2023, the specialties that required the MSRA are listed on screen right now. So it's become sort of like a postgrad version of uh, the UCAT. So it consists of two parts. So one of them is professional dilemmas, which is essentially an SJT. So you'll have a few scenarios like the one that's listed on screen and you'll be asked to rank them. So it's, it's almost exactly like the SJT that you would have done at the end of medical school. So you go through 50 scenarios and that's worth 50% of your total score. Then you have clinical problem solving, which is the remaining 50%, and that consists of 97 questions, which are mainly sort of primary care focused. So you can see from the examples below uh, that both questions are, are sort of uh, primary care related questions as opposed to being uh, more sort of hospital medicine based. Um, so that gives you an idea of what the MSRA actually entails. So moving on to the anesthetics interview, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the interview format just so you know what it is like. And bear in mind that all of these things are subject to change. So what I'm speaking about is what happened in the 2023 application cycle, but please do make sure you check the website to see whether any of this stuff had changed. So one part of the interview is a clinical interview. It lasts 15 minutes and you are given some sort of uh, acute clinical scenario. So usually an unwell patient that needs to be assessed and managed. So I've given an example of the vignette uh, on there. The second half, which is also 15 minutes, is, uh, is a general interview. So this is where they test a bunch of different parameters to determine how suitable you are to be an, uh, to be an anesthetics trainee. So it is important to really research the criteria that they use, and they are very transparent about it, to be honest. They pu publish all sorts of stuff on their website, being very clear about the types of um, experiences that will uh, be rewarded um, at the interview. And one other point to bear in mind is that, of course, a couple of these things are fairly technical, so talking about QIs or managing an acutely unwell patient, but in fact you get a third of the points just as a global rating score. So being able to present yourself in an amicable and uh, confident manner really does go a very, very long way. Um, so it's not just about the technical stuff and the audit and the quips and all of those types of things. Uh, just being able to come across as a nice person who would make a good anaesthetics trainee is a really big chunk of the points you can be awarded. So that brings me on to the most important part, which is what can you actually do now to improve your chances? So I'm not going to talk too much about the interview because this talk is probably most useful for people who are a bit earlier on, where they are just thinking about applying for anesthetics and want to see how they can use their time as best as possible to maximize their chances. So I've made a few pretty pretty clear bullet points based on the criteria that the anesthetics recruitment office um, publishes um, about you know what makes a good candidate. So these there are a few domains uh, to work on. So first of all, there's commitment to specialty and things that you can do are taster days in anesthetics. Um, the RCOA has a career in anesthesia day, which is really amazing. They go through so many different aspects of working as an anesthetist and even go through how to prepare for interviews and exams. Um, networking, so just speaking to various ACCS and anesthetics trainees that you come across through work or through medical school, uh, even using things like LinkedIn, all of that really does go a long way. I would recommend looking up the ACCS curriculum just so that you're familiar with the different stages and what's expected of you. Um, it's also interesting to read up on all the different careers that you can pursue. So, for example, doing intensive care or pre-hospital emergency medicine. Um, and finally, a very easy thing that you can do in your spare time is just read articles in things like the British Journal of Anesthetics. 
As for teaching, audit, QI, and research, that's all kind of lumped together into one domain. So you could organize or participate in a teaching program. You could try and get some sort of teaching diploma or PG cert. Um, doing audits and QIs are, are universally very, very uh, lucrative in terms of um, in terms of points for specialty training, whether it's anesthetics or not. And then, of course, publications and presentations you can speak about uh, at an interview and uh, really demonstrate that you've developed some research skills along the way. Moving on to reflective practice. So this is actually a really, really um, underappreciated but very important domain when it comes to preparing for uh, interviews and preparing your application. So all of us, as we go through our clinical careers, should spend a reasonable amount of time thinking about uh, the decisions that we made, things that have gone well, things that have gone badly, and really trying to figure out how can we do things better moving forward. Um, so the anesthetics uh, recruitment office are very keen on this. So they really do um, value um, doing things like PDPs and writing reflections and DOPSs and KEXs. Uh, all of these things are worth keeping a note of in your portfolio, just so you can rifle through them when it comes to the interview um, and have a few examples up your sleeve of, of times that you've uh, benefited from feedback and it's actually changed your practice and, um, and in the long run improved patient care. And finally, qualifications and experience. So this is a slightly vague um, domain, but it essentially means anything else that's, uh, that would make them a suitable candidate. So taster days, again, would probably fall into this uh, remit, as well as things like doing an ITU fellow job in an F3 year. Um, other things that are worth doing are things like the MRCP, um, if you're interested. It's not something that's by any means um, a prerequisite for doing anesthetics. You absolutely don't have to do it. Um, but it's probably the most relevant exam, postgraduate exam, that you're able to do before becoming an anaesthetics trainee. So I mentioned that at my interview, and uh, they seem to quite like that. And then there's other things like um, various courses, like ultrasound courses that you could do um, to really uh, come across as showing an, a proactive interest in developing your skills. And then these are skills that could certainly be applied in the context of anaesthetics going forwards. So I hope that's clear enough. I didn't want to overload you with information um, because I think when you're at that stage where you're trying to think about your portfolio and what to do next, uh, you really do need to be tactful because um, time, is, time is finite. It does go by quite quickly, especially when you are working. Uh, and hence, you need to try and pick and choose which aspects of your portfolio are perhaps a little bit weaker and try and strengthen them and bolster them as best as pos possible by taking meaningful, actionable next steps. So I would certainly recommend just having a good look at this slide and just highlighting or circling whatever you think um, you are probably lacking most at this point in time. Some of them are easier to achieve than others, but nonetheless, you can definitely you know, take, um, take the next steps uh, to, to building a better portfolio. So I really do hope this was useful and please do get in touch if you have any questions.